Hi, everyone. Um, I am going to give a quick overview so that we're all on the same page because light happens to be this incredibly specific, detailed uh, industry where we like to use a lot of very technical language and there's a lot of very technical, talented people up here, but I want to make sure that we're all using the same words uh, before we really start any discussions. So key terms and metrics. Then I'm going to jump into a little bit of the code again to make sure that we're all on the same page and we're using the same words. And then I'll talk a little bit about daylighting best, pr best practices and um, the first principles of design. So a little bit about me. Um, I've been working on daylighting and lighting underground spaces for about 15 years. I worked on the low line uh, project, which was investigating new technologies to potentially have plants growing underground. I uh, worked on Fulton Street Transit Center and a bunch of other crazy underground projects. Did a lot of work uh, in heavy civil infrastructure, Second Avenue Subway, those projects. And um, just last year I moved over to WeWork. So most of what I'm talking about today has a lot to do with my prior experience and uh, heavy love for light and daylight, for infrastructure, also for people and artwork and all of that. Worked a lot on museums in that process as well. So key terms and metrics. Um, we're going to talk about lumens, illuminance, lumens, sorry, luminance. See how tricky they are? They're all the same. Uh, reflectance, finish, and diffusion, color rendering, and color temperature. Because they're actually a lot more simple once they're cleared out. So lumens. Lumens is the word that we use to describe a quantity of visible light. Uh, we've got a couple metrics up here. A street light, maybe 10,000 lumens. Um, a typical down light's about 200 to uh, 700 lumens. A candle would be about 10 lumens. I don't know the word for how many lumens the sun produces because it's a bigger number than I could com possibly comprehend. So, and I studied advanced math. So illuminance is a measure of the total quantity of light falling on a unit area. So. This is either in foot candles or in lux. Foot candles being one lumen per square foot. Lux being one lumen per meter squared. So these tend to have, a, these always have a one to 10 ratio between them. Uh, one foot candle is equal to 10 lux. In the US, we tend to use foot candles. I use them, unfortunately, inter interchangeably in my head. So if I mess that up, we're gonna try to talk about just foot candles today but I do mess this, mess this up a lot. So what are, what are foot candles? How many foot candles is the, the right amount? What do we need to see? Our eyes are these extraordinary things that allow us to see magnitudes of one to 10,000 difference between them. No digital technology is capable of doing anything like that. So outside on a bright sunny day, there are 10,000 foot candles on the ground. That's a huge amount. It can be too much light, way too much light. Um, on an overcast day, it's closer to 1,000 foot candles. Inside, in order to do a heavy, detailed reading task, we need and would ask for somewhere around 50 foot candles. So we're, we typically talk about illuminance in a log scale, meaning a 10-base scale, because our eyes are capable of dealing with all of this information, our interior electric lighting technology tends to be up to about 100 to 1,000 foot candles, um, which is a, a whole, a huge amount. Um, and, or sorry, up to 100 foot candles. See, I just jumped into Lux again. Um, but then we're also capable of seeing 0.001 foot candles. It's a much, much lower illumination level, but you can go outside on a starry night or a moonlight and be able to see perfectly well so long as your eye has time to adjust. So for most work tasks, 25 foot candles is more than enough. Um, for socialization, 10 foot candles, more than enough. But at nighttime, we would never want 10 foot candles. We want less than a foot candle. We want like 0.05. If you're in a half of a foot candle outside at night, you're like, why is this so bright? This feels uncomfortable. Um, so time of day is super important when we think and talk about uh, illumination targets. It's also really important to think and about what you're doing and what the illumination is needed. 
So if we start to pull these two things together, we think about the amount of light that's available outside all the time and the amount of light that we have inside in order to do, t do anything, we need, for doing super uh, fine print tasks where high visual acuity, 5% uh, of the light outside on an overcast day or 0.5% of the light outside on a bright sunny day. For most tasks, it's closer to 2% or 0.2% on a bright sunny day. Um, and then for socialization, we're talking about really like only 1%. So we don't need much daylight inside, and actually we don't want much daylight inside in order to be doing uh, and achieving what we want. The next thing I'm going to talk about, and this is my little uh, rant, because illuminance, while it's the metric that's easiest to measure, has very little to do with how we actually perceive space. These two pieces of paper and that desk would all measure the same illuminance. But if you can imagine, uh, your eye obviously perceives them much different. Different Luminance is the measure of the light that's bouncing off of a material back to your eye. So this means the material finish of a room is much more important to the, how the space is perceived and the, the brightness that's perceived and the mood of the space than, of course, the light that's falling onto that wall. Both of them are related, but it's just emphasizing how important material and color are. Is that clear? Yeah. So I would prefer that we consider and talk about luminance in the future uh, as a, a metric that then includes the actual properties of the space and not just the light falling onto those surfaces. But it's a little bit more difficult to regulate. So reflectance is something, usually people think reflectance, they think shiny mirror. But that, in the lighting world, it's actually not reflectance. Reflectance has to do with how much light is uh, reflecting off of a surface and how much is being absorbed by it. So when we have white light coming in, this is white light that's all around us, hitting this blue surface, what's happening here? All of the spectrum of the rest of the colors are being absorbed, and the blue is being reflected. So this is absorbing red and yellow and green, and this uh, blue light's popping off. Same thing here. The more saturated the colors, the more light is being absorbed and the fewer wavelengths are being reflected. Finish is what we talk about relative to how the light is then coming off of a surface, whether it's smooth and lambertian, like that wall here, or has a little bit of specularity, like this beautiful uh, Phoenician plaster on the right. Next little piece I'm going to talk about is the spectral power density. Um, or the color rendering. Daylight has a continuous spectrum, which means that it renders all of the colors in the same way. We, hit, we will definitely have the right color to be able to reflect off of the wall so we look right. Electric lighting is working towards getting that type of spectrum, but there, is, there are many good ones and there are many bad ones. And the rest of the panelists, or one in particular, will talk a lot more about spectral power density. I just want to emphasize that it's really important to how we are able to view and uh, perceive objects. I show the apples. There's a much better image that people tend to remember quite a bit better later in this presentation. But the importance is, is color temperature is the same for all of these, but the apples look much different because of the amount of light spectrum or the difference in light spectrum in each source. And then there's a bunch of complicated math. We won't go into this. It's much less exciting. But the point is, it really changes the way that people look and feel, and it also has a lot of uh, impact on our own physiology. But everyone else is going to get into that a little bit later. Color temperature, we're going to talk about. So the spectral power density is related to color temperature, but the two are very different things. Um, we talk about uh, color temperature in Kelvin. This is relative to the um, temp the color that would be perceived on a black body radiator if it was heated up to these degrees Kelvin, which is sort of a crazy thing to think about because who th actually looks at a piece of metal that's being heated up in order to figure out what the right color white is, but that's what we do. Um, the point is warm color temperatures are a lower temperature, so 2000 to 3000 K. Cold color temperatures, the blues, are um, hotter, so 6,000 K, it's just something to keep consistent. The, the thing that's a little bit confusing is 
people are uh, frequently asked, oh, I want daylight white for my interior space, right? Because daylight's natural and this is going to feel good. But this sky is amazing, and it does this incredible uh, Rayleigh scatter of, uh, illuminate, of white light that allows direct transmission of the warmer color temperatures, the warm sunlight, and diffuses all of the blue sunlight. So even though we perceive the color of the sky and measure it to be a, a cold blue in the 6,000K, it actually feels much warmer because we have those two, uh, two different parts of the spectrum every time we're outside. Shadows look blue, direct sun looks yellow, uh, but it all comes together into white. Inside, we really do want a warmer color temperature. We've, always, we've evolved to be by the fire. Um, the interesting thing, and this is a, a time-lapse photography that I um, took of the New York skyline, is that shift in color temperature is dynamic over the course of the day. So we have a different color in the um, noon time, and then this beautiful transition from day to night that happens in the magic hour, and then we go into much more saturated and deep blues. So, go down the, the key terms. Excellent. <laughs> so, basements. What is a basement? This, this is the thing I was so nervous about giving uh, any presentation here, because I'm like, I think that windows are extremely important for our habitable spaces. I couldn't possibly uh, recommend that we don't have windows in habitable spaces. And then I was like, oh, we're talking about basements? Basements are always 50% or more above ground. Like, we're not even talking about underground spaces. We're talking about less than 50% underground spaces. A cellar is a space that's more than 50% underground. So no matter what, relative to the code that we're talking about today, we're talking about a space that is still 50% above ground. That means it has a window where you could see the sky. So section 27.2058, which describes the uh, required windows for light in the New York City Code. Um, this is simplified. I, I eliminated a few exceptions. Um, every living room shall have one window. Uh, no window shall be basically uh, completely uh, on the lot line so that it's completely um, obstructed by something else. So there has to be at least six feet on the other side of the window. And then relative to the size of windows, um, the windows in the room shall at le be at least one-tenth of the floor area of that room. Uh, each window has to be, a, or each working window has to be at least 12 square feet. Um, one half of the window shall be able to open. There's a bunch of exceptions there regarding mechanical stuff. Um, and then every window shall be at least seven feet above the floor, the top of the window. So uh, this is the context. I'm not going to provide any notes about whether I think that they're right or wrong, but like this is where we are right now with the code relative to light. So now I'm going to talk about my other passion, which is first principles and daylighting, and then we can reflect back on those general uh, guidelines to see if there's something that needs a little bit more investigation. So when you think about daylight, we think about probability of sunshine, what's the climate, what's the weather in the space, Location and orientation of our aperture. Top light versus side light. Is it a skylight? Is it a, a window? Um, the window height versus the room depth. There's some very standard practices there. Um, what, whether we have sky view or if it's completely obstructed. The glazing aperture and type of glazing. Material reflectance and contrast. So I will go through these pretty quickly. For, this, for purposes of this conversation, we don't have control over probability of sunshine. That's New York City climate. We're about 50% chance of sunlight every day, which is great. Um, location or orientation, that's going to vary by location, by each site. So ignoring those. Um, right now, we're prescribing it has to be a window. But this is a project that I worked on at the Israel Museum in Jerusalem. And this is a completely underground space that's using top light with, that's uh, exhibited as a side light. And it's an incredibly beautiful space. So I don't think that that's something that we should be eliminating for context. Window height versus room depth. Rule of thumb, window height will provide usable daylight, that 2 to 5% that I talked about, a distance of 2 and a half times that window height into the space. Really simple rule of thumb. Works for everything. 
except when there are obst obstructions present, the thing that we um, like to do is the sky view analysis. So here, what, at what point could you draw a line where you could still see the sky? You're still going to be beautifully daylit within that zone of the space. Make sense? Um, and sky view may be much more important than light levels. This is another project I worked on. We bring daylight five stories underground. This is Fulton Street Transit Center. You can go and visit it if you haven't been. Um, but the point being, this space is incredibly obstructed by, from sun, but the, the way that it's designed and the way that the light's distributed connects everyone to the fact that there's the sky, there's the sun, and here you have this beautiful dome in connection to the natural world. Glazing aperture and type is obviously the next piece. Um, and this, there are a number of additional rules of thumb um, relative to quantities there. Um, but all of them we have a lot of control over, and none of them uh, which we have defined clearly in the code. And then material reflectance and contrast. Um, this is a, sh a small tidbit example to show what can be done uh, with good design with a very small amount of light uh, to create a space that feels dynamic, um, vibrant, and uh, is sustaining life and growth beyond just humans. So to reconsider the guides of where we are, um, I'm going to go through one by one. Every room shall have a window. Yes, but what about if it's a skylight? Um, no uh, window shall have uh, space less than six feet, but what if it's much bigger than six feet? What if we have a greater opportunity? Maybe we should consider that and an exception along those lines. Um, the total area of the window should be at least one-tenth of the floor area. I think this needs more study. Um, and the, every window should, must be 12 feet. This has nothing to do with daylighting principles. So I think that one really needs an investigation because it's not about the size of an indiv individual unit. It's about the accumulated window to wall area in each room. Um, the, every window shall open, also not really having anything to do with daylight. And then the last one, uh, should, the required window height should be seven feet off the floor. What if it's more? Maybe we need to have additional allowances if it's more than that. So that's all for me. Now we're going to dive into something much more uh, novel, interesting, new, coming from the space station. <laughs>